This lecture is about system F. So for a general introduction to polymorphism and the distinction between parametric polymorphism and ad hoc polymorphism, we will talk about these topics in class in the online meeting. Uh, this lecture is about system F. System F is a direct extension of untyped lambda calculus with a polymorphism. Untyped lambda calculus with a polymorphism. Polymorphism consisting of, for example, type variables, type abstraction, and type application. So let's start with uh, let's start with a simple example. Let's say we have lambda x dot x denoting an identity function in untyped lambda calculus. The goal is we'd like it to assign a type to this identity function in untyped lambda calculus. So what kind of type can we assign, for example, to this variable x? So for the sake of argument, let's say we have a primitive type bool. It turns out that we don't need this primitive type bool because we can we can show how to simulate how how to implement this type bool in terms of lambda abstractions. But for now, let's just assume that there is a primitive type bool. So we can assign, for example, type bool arrow bool to this polymorphic uh, this identity function in untyped lambda calculus that's fine but that's not what we really want because this identity function should be able to use we should be able to use this identity function for all types not simple not just the bool but for other types like int or int times a bool or int arrow int and in fact all all kinds of types out there so this is fine in this case we could for example annotate this variable x with type bool so in that case this one have this one has a type bool arrow bool but that's not what we really want what we want is we'd like it to assign some any type not just the bool uh, we'd like to assign any type to this variable x not just a particular type bool because this identity function lambda x dot x does not stipulate any particular type for this variable x the set of values that this variable x can range over so we would like to use we'd like to permit any type for the type of this variable x. So for this purpose, let's introduce type variable. Type variable. So for historical reason, we use this Greek alphabet to denote type variables, for example, alpha. So let's, for now, let's read this alpha as some any type. So informally speaking, this any type or this type alpha denotes some any type that you can use, including of course bool and int and all the other types shown over here. Then now we can make an improvement over the previous attempt here. In this in the first attempt, we fixed a we fixed a type for this variable x as some concrete type bool, but now let's assign this any type to this variable x, where alpha stands for any type, not just the bool, not just the bool, but all the other types as well. But then we can assign type alpha arrow alpha for any type alpha. 
So now we don't, we no longer need to fix the type for this variable x as bool, for example, because we can use any type. So that's definitely an improvement over the previous attempt. But this still has its own problem. So let's consider uh, this example. This time we have two variables, lambda x, lambda y, and uh, we return the pair of these two variables x and y. Of course, we don't have this pair yet, but let's assume that this pair construct is available. And it turns out that we can simulate, uh, we can implement this pair construct in terms of the lambda abstractions and type, polymorphic types. So we will see how later. So for now, let's just assume that this pair construct is available. So this function, this pairing function, takes two independent values, x and y, and then pair them up. Now, what kind of type can you assign to this lambda abstraction? Of course, we can assign, for example, bool, arrow, bool, arrow, bool, times bool, assuming that this product type is available for pairs. But this is not what we, what we really want. Because the syntax, the, this lambda abstraction says nothing about the particular choice of the type for this variable x. It says nothing about type pool, for example. So this is fine, but this is not what, what we really want. Then we go back to this uh, new concept called any type. Because x can have any type. And at the same time, y can have any type. You may use any type for this variable x and variable y. So why don't we assign any type? So here we are going to assign any type. And the notation we introduced previously is this uh, Greek alphabet alpha. So let's, let's write alpha here. And then similarly, y can also have any type. So let's us let's use the same Greek alphabet a, uh, alpha here, and then we have x comma y. Now what's the type of the whole expression? It is give me alpha, and then give me another alpha, and then I'm going to return this product type. So this is this is definitely better answer than the previous one, this one, because at least we can use any type, for instance, bool, int, and so on. So this is better than this one, but still, it's not what we really want, because our intuition says there is no relation whatsoever between this variable x and variable y. So for instance, when x assumes the type bool, there is no reason that y must assume the same type bool. It literally says x can have any type and y can have any other type independently of the choice for this variable x. So still, the use of this single type, uh, single letter alpha, uh, this is actually type variable. So this single type variable is inadequate. We need to be able to distinguish between the type to be assigned to variable y and the type to be assigned to variable x. So it turns out that for this particular example, we need two any types. Not just one, but two any types because x and y are completely independent of each other. So we'd like to be able to assign different types to x and y. So let's, let's uh, for x, let's use alpha, and for y, let's use another any type beta. So for example now, lambda x alpha, so this stands for any type, and y is going to have a type a beta here, and this also stands for any type, but these two letters are distinct, which means that they actually denote different types. Then, 
we can assign this type. Give me some uh, any type alpha, give me another any type beta, then I'm going to return alpha times beta. So this is much better than this one because we can assign any types to variable, variables x and y. without assuming that they assume the same type. So perhaps we'd like to assign this type to this expression, but there's one problem here, which is we should answer the question, where does this type variable alpha come from? So this any type is now called actually type variable. So let's write type variable. So instead of saying any type, let's say, Let's call them type variable. So these type variables are precisely the type variables that you learned from OCaml programming. So you can think of this, this one alpha, uh, beta as the type variables apostrophe a, apostrophe b, and so on, or alpha, beta in OCaml programming. So now we have two type variables. So instead of saying any type, let's write type variable. So this is a type variable, and this is another type variable. And we should answer the question, where do these type variables come from? So we should actually indicate the source of these type variables. And in the beginning, we start with the no type variables. So we have to introduce these type variables ourselves. So to this end, we, we introduce new uh, language construct called type abstraction. Type abstraction, uh, capital lambda alpha dot e. So this one basically says, I'm going to introduce a fresh new type variable alpha and of course I can use this type variable alpha in expression E. So literally it introduces the new type variable. Then let's go back to this example. So before we start to use this type variable alpha and this type variable beta, we have to introduce them because in the beginning, we start with a no type variable. So in this example, let's introduce type variable alpha with this type abstraction, capital lambda alpha. And this thing says, I have just introduced type variable alpha. So now you may use uh, this type variable alpha in the rest of the expression. So now this is valid. And then we introduce another type variable using type abstraction. So you have this capital lambda a beta, which introduces the new type variable. And in the rest of the expression, you may use this type variable. So we use this type variable beta here. Now, now uh, we can tell where these type variables are introduced. This is introduced here, this is introduced here. So now the whole expression makes sense. But that's not the end of the story because we have to make an update in the type of this expression according to, the, according to these two type abstractions. We have to do something about here. So it turns out that if expression E has a type A, so this expression E has a type A, then this type abstraction is going to have this polymorphic type for all alpha dot A. It literally called for all. The later command for this symbol is literally for all. So to summarize, if you'd like to introduce new type variable, then you have to use this type abstraction. This one introduces new type variable alpha. And then inside expression E, of course, you may use a type variable alpha. 
like this one. And then if expression E has a type A, then the whole type abstraction is going to have a type for all alpha dot A. So this is a bit precisely the polymorphic type that we will be talking about in the rest of the lecture. So this is a polymorphic type. Therefore, we have to adjust the type of this expression. It's not just the alpha arrow, beta, blah, blah, blah. It is first, I introduce type variable alpha. So for all alpha, for all beta, give me alpha and give me beta, then I'm going to return a product, alpha product of beta. So which complies with our intuitive interpreting, informal interpreting. For all alpha, literally it's a for all, alpha, for all beta, give me alpha, give me beta, then I'm going to return alpha times a beta. So this is the type that can be assigned to this expression. So this is how we introduce the uh, type abstraction. The one minor note here is so we have this one. So let me write it over here. For all alpha, for all theta, give me alpha, give me beta, and I'm returning alpha times beta. So a minor note to remember here is this for all quantifier and this function type, this one has a higher precedence over this one. So this one. Uh, so, for example, if we have for all alpha, alpha, arrow, alpha, this is not equal to for all alpha, alpha, arrow, alpha, because this guy has a higher precedence, higher pre operator precedence than this for all. So, this guy prefers to bind with this one first before it binds to this one. So, proper way of reading this one is for all alpha. Presses alpha arrow alpha. But usually we simply omit this one. Uh, so this one is actually for all alpha, alpha arrow alpha. Simply we omit these parentheses. I just want you to remember here. So what we learned so far is we introduce a type abstraction. Type abstraction is a capital lambda. So it's almost like a lambda abstraction. So let's compare this one against uh, lambda abstraction, lambda x dot e. So this one introduces a variable x, and inside expression e, you may use x. Similarly here, this is type abstraction. The only difference is, instead of ordinary variable like x that ranges over, for example, Boolean, integers, etc., you introduce a type variable alpha. And you may use this type variable alpha inside expression e. And this one has a type perhaps A arrow B or something like this. And this type abstraction has type, it's polymorphic type. Now, um, then what about the Now let's uh, now what about the dual notion, dual to type abstraction? In the case of Lambda abstraction, you have the dual notion called lambda application. Expression E applied to expression E prime. So this is lambda application. Uh, this lambda application, well, if everything goes fine, then this expression will produce something like lambda x E uh, E prime. Let's say this is E zero. At which point you actually substitute expression e prime for variable x. So for this lambda abstraction, we have the counterpart called lambda application. And similarly, it's a type abstraction, we have a type application. So let me write it over here. So here we have lambda abstraction. For example, lambda x dot expression e. And we have a corresponding lambda application. So for instance, if we have lambda x dot e applied to e prime, 
e prime. What we do is to reduce this one by substituting e prime for x in expression e. So for instance, this expression e prime can be integer 1 when this variable x ranges over the set of integers. So that's what we are already familiar with. Now let's talk about capital lambda abstraction, which is a type abstraction. Uh, so this is actually a uh, type abstraction. So type abstraction, the syntax for type abstraction is capital lambda alpha dot e. So this variable x is going to assume the argument, the concrete argument, for example, integer 1. And the only difference here in the case of a type abstraction is this is a type variable, not integer variable or Boolean variable. It's a type variable. So it is going to assume pi. So things look quite complicated, but actually it's quite simple. So if this x was integer variable, then later we will substitute concrete integer for this variable x. And in the case of type abstraction, this is a type variable. So we are going to uh -oh. we are going to supply a concrete type. Type is a. So this is meta variable for types. So we are going to provide the concrete type. That's all. So again, in the case of type abstraction, let's say this is integer variable. This is integer variable. Then later we will substitute integer for this integer variable in lambda application. In a completely analogous way, we have type application. In the case of type application, we are going to substitute pi for this type variable. Just like we substitute integer, just like we substitute an integer for this integer variable. So we substitute concrete type for this type variable. And the notation that we use is this one, expression E double bracket type A. So this is called type application. So if you have, for example, lambda, oh, uh, sorry. This is type type abstraction. We have lambda capital lambda alpha dot e applied to concrete type A. So for instance, A can be bool or int or any type out there. Then what happens? In the case of <coughs> in the case of a lambda abstraction, a lambda application, you substitute this expression e prime for variable x in expression e. Similarly, here you are going to substitute this type for type variable alpha. This is the type variable in expression e. So we reuse so we reuse the familiar notation. Substitute a for type variable alpha in expression e. So that's the reduction that we will see later. So to summarize, in order to introduce new type variable to denote any type, you have to use this type abstraction, capital lambda alpha dot e. And this is just a, another form of abstraction, so there should be the corresponding application, which is the type application. So here. So if you apply this type abstraction to this concrete type, what you do is just to substitute this type for this type variable alpha in expression E. So let's consider an example. So the, the first example was lambda x dot x, and the question was, what kind of type can we assign to this uh, identity function in untyped lambda calculus? So the idea is, Introduce, uh, introduce type variable alpha and then use this type 
alpha for this variable x. Then what is the type of this expression? This guy has a type alpha arrow alpha. And therefore, the whole expression is going to have for all alpha, alpha arrow alpha, which is consistent with our informal reading, um, informal way of reading this expression for all alpha, alpha arrow alpha. Now, we'd like to apply, uh, sorry, we'd like to apply this identity function to, for example, Boolean true. Let's assume that there is Boolean true already defined of a type bool. First, this one doesn't make sense uh, applying this expression directly to Boolean true. This doesn't make sense because this is not function type, this is a polymorphic type. So whatever comes here, if you'd like to apply this one to Boolean true, whatever comes here must have a type bool arrow bool. But the current expression here has this polymorphic type. So the first step is we somehow convert this expression into another one of a type bool arrow bool. And that's precisely when we bring this type abstraction into play. So what we do is we apply this type abstraction to uh, sorry type abstraction to boolean type. Then the whole expression, this type application, this type application is going to type bool arrow bool. Now we are ready to apply this expression to boolean constant true. So this guy has a bool arrow bool. This guy has a type bool. So the whole expression is going to have a bool type bool. So that's an example of using these type abstractions and type applications in programming in system F. So what we learned is uh, type abstraction and type application. Now let's develop the, the language system F, starting with uh, abstract syntax. So system F abstract syntax. So we have a type and we have expression and we have value v. So type is function type. Now we have any type that is the polymorphic type. So we have alpha alpha, beta, gamma, and all these uh, Greek alphabet. And we have this polymorphic type for all alpha, a. And for expression, we have a variable, a lambda abstraction, and application. And we have type abstraction, capital lambda, alpha, expression E, and type application expression E applied to type A. And this one is counted as a value, and this one is also counted as a value. But that's the entire syntax for system F. Notice that unlike simply type lambda calculus, we don't have a base type. So we don't have a base type P, such as bool, int, and so on. And the reason for that is you can actually now simulate all these beta type, base types inside the system F. We will see how to uh, program all these Boolean type, natural number, etc. So basically, we are going to exploit the idea from church Booleans and church numerals. So, unlike simply type lambda calculus, we don't have this base type. That's a big difference from the simply type lambda calculus when we develop system F. 
Another thing to note here is when you apply type abstraction to a concrete type, there's no restriction on the set of types that can appear in type application. In other words, we don't have extra condition on this type A. So you may use any type for this. Um, for this type A. So we'll come back to this issue later. So first, let's develop the operation semantics or reduction rules. So we are going to reuse all the reduction rules from um, on type lambda calculus for this fragment. So let's just skip the reduction rules for this reconstruct. So reduction rules. Now what is the reduction rule for this one, there's no reduction rule for this type abstraction because it is a failure. So the only form of expression that is left is this type application. So how do we reduce expression E applied to type A? It is not necessarily a failure, so you keep reducing this expression. If this one produces E prime, then it has E prime applied to A. And if everything goes okay, then you will eventually produce capital lambda alpha expression E applied to type A. So in this case now, you substitute this type A for type variable alpha. So A for alpha in expression E. So these are the two new reduction rules in system F. Now, uh, let's consider what it means to allow any type, uh, any type A in type application. So it has actually huge implication when it comes to the expressive power of system F. So here's an example. Uh-oh. We have this. Uh, so we have this lambda x dot x, and eventually we figured out the corresponding expression in system F, which is capital lambda alpha, lambda x alpha dot x, and it is a type for all alpha, alpha l alpha. Now let's apply this expression to type bool. Assuming that bool has been already introduced, then it's going to have type bool arrow bool. So in this case, we substitute this boolean type, type bool, for this type variable alpha. But if we go back to the syntax here, there's no restriction on the set of types that you may use in type application. There's no extra condition here. No, no extra condition here. So therefore, for example, we can actually apply this type abstraction to its type itself. This is legitimate because there is no extra condition restricting the set of types that you may use here. Any type A, any valid type A, any valid type in system F may be used here. So in, that, in this case, what is the result of the type? The result of type is Alpha has been replaced with this one. So it has type for all alpha, alpha, arrow, alpha, arrow, for all alpha, alpha, arrow, alpha. So this is the type. So you could try to find an expression in OCaml of this type, but you will eventually fail because OCaml doesn't support this type, this kind of type. So <clears throat> So this is actually the source of the huge, the huge expressive power of system F. You may use any type in type application. So for instance, you can have an expression of this type, which is not expressible in OCaml, for example. On the other hand, this is also the source of interactability of system F. 
intractable. So basically, uh, it means that system F is hard to tame, it's hard to control. And as it turns out, system F is not actually a good basis for practical programming language precisely for this reason. It turns out that if you allow any type, any valid type in type application, the type inference is undecidable. Undecidable. So basically, in a given, if you are given expression E, you'd like to find the most general type for this expression E. So what is the type that we can assign to expression E? And this is actually undecidable in system F, unlike OCaml, which is decidable. So there's a trade-off between expressive power and type inference, the capability of a type inferencing, and we will come back to this issue later. For now, just think about this example, which has this type, this polymorphic type. But interestingly, this type is not permitted in OCaml, which means that you cannot implement this expression in OCaml. And there's a good reason for that, and we will learn why in a later lecture. Now, let's consider another example uh, before we start to develop type system. We'd like it to build a composing function. So, so basically, uh, it returns if f has a type alpha arrow beta and g has beta arrow gamma, perhaps the compose fg is going to have a type alpha arrow gamma. And let's, let's implement this compose function in two different ways to illustrate that this a, uh, this type of abstraction can appear anywhere in your in your expression. So what I'm saying is this type abstraction may appear anywhere in your expression. So here's the first attempt. So perhaps you need three type variables, alpha, beta, and gamma. So the in the first attempt, why don't we introduce all these type variables at once in the beginning? So let's introduce uh, type variable alpha, type variable beta, and type variable gamma. So we have already introduced all these type variables. Now, what is the compose? Give me function f of type alpha arrow beta. Give me another function z of type beta arrow gamma. And I'm going to return the composition of the two functions. So it has a type. Uh, the argument type is alpha. You first uh, apply f and then g, and it turns out this one has a type gamma. Then this one has a type, what is the type of this compose? It is for all alpha, for all theta, for all gamma, given me alpha arrow beta, given me beta arrow gamma, then I'm going to return alpha arrow gamma by composing the two functions. And this is not the only way to implement this compose because this lambda abstraction, uh, sorry, this capital lambda abstraction, type abstraction, may appear later here. So the idea is, in the beginning, when we talk about the function f, we don't need the, the third type variable, gamma. So why don't we postpone the introduction of type variable gamma? So in this case, uh, let's introduce type variable alpha, type variable beta, and then introduce the function f right away. f has a type alpha arrow beta. Now we need the third type variable. So here is here that we introduce type variable gamma. Now uh, g has a type beta arrow gamma, and then we uh, the rest of the expression is the same. And what's the type of the second attempt of this compose? It has for all alpha, for all beta, give me alpha arrow beta, and then I'm going to introduce another type variable gamma and give me 
theta arrow gamma, then I'm going to return alpha arrow gamma. So in practice, these two implementations of a compose would be uh, not different in practice, but the these two implementations are actually different uh, in the position of introduction introducing the third type variable. So finally, let's develop the type system for system F. So type system for system F. Before we proceed to the definition of typing context, we have to actually address this issue, this pesky issue, which is the um, the validity of a given type. So, for example, we have x alpha arrow beta. So this is a type binding. So this type binding looks innocent. There seems to be nothing wrong with this type binding, but there's a, a big problem, which is we have to answer the question, where does this type variable alpha come from? Where does this type variable beta come from? So this type, this type binding makes sense only if you have previously introduced a type variable alpha and beta somewhere. Without introducing type variables alpha and beta, this type binding doesn't make sense. So to, in order to express that this is a valid type binding with associated type variables alpha and beta defined somewhere earlier, we extend this typing context, the definition of a typing context in this way. So typing context gamma is either empty or it is type binding. And also we have this type variable declaration alpha type. So this thing means I'm going to introduce type variable alpha and in the rest of a typing context, you may use type variable alpha. Then this type binding is legitimate only if we have this type variable declaration earlier. So without this type variable declaration, then this doesn't make sense. This is bad. But suppose that if we have this declaration alpha is a valid type, and beta is also fairly the type, then this type binding is now OK. So remember that now, because you allow type variables in type binding, you always have to make sure that these type variables are legitimate to use. That is, when you use alpha, beta in type binding, Make sure that the corresponding type variable declarations appear earlier. This in turn implies that now this typing context is interpreted as an ordered, ordered collection. Now the order of this type binding and type variable declarations doesn't matter. So for instance, this is fine because this type variable declaration appears before this one, but this would be this would be wrong. This would not be allowed. After this type binding, you declare type variable alpha and beta. And this is not allowed. So remember that we introduced this type variable declaration to to check if this type binding is OK. Now, uh, let's develop the type system. We introduce a two judgment. The first is a type judgment, which we write type gamma turnstile A type. So basically, this thing means under typing context the gamma, A is valid. The type is valid, something like this one. And the other is the ordinary typing judgment. Gamma turnstile expression, it has a type A. And the inference rules for this type judgment are called the type rules. And of course, the inference rules for this typing judgment are called typing rules. So from here, we use type rules. 
and for this one we call them typing rules now it's time to develop all these type rules and typing rules so with the intuition in mind intuition on the type abstraction and type application actually it's pretty easy to develop all these typing rules there's nothing complicated here although you might be a bit intimidated by the scope of this language but the typing rules should be simple because inherently there is nothing complicated here you only have lambda abstraction and lambda application and you only have capital lambda abstraction i mean type abstraction and type application and essentially we share the same principle for these two seemingly different sets of language constructs but the underlying principle is the same it's just the abstraction and application so do not get intimidated by this language the typing rules are actually quite simple so let's develop the typing rules so the first is uh, this type rules and this is actually quite easy when can we deduce this function type is a valid type well a must be valid type and b must be valid type then when can we deduce this type variable alpha is a valid type of course alpha must be already declared in somewhere in typing context gamma so therefore you require that this type declaration type variable declaration alpha type should be found somewhere in typing context gamma then you may use this type variable alpha what about the final polymorphic type inside the inside the type a you may have type variable alpha so I'd like